So you would have to work 77 hours to afford a modest one bedroom at fair market rent. So it just shows how a true living wage would be at the rate of what you could afford for to, to afford a two bedroom a two bedroom apartment, which would be yeah, yeah, well housing. above $37 an hour. Yeah, Washington's expensive, you know, and, uh, you know, when I first put my platform out, it was just like this big list of like 17 things. And uh, I had to narrow it down to I didn't narrow it down, but I chose a few to emphasize. And I chose the four that we've gone over so far. So healthcare, housing, education and wages uh, and put them under the banner of make Washington affordable, because the thing that people are really feeling is just that there's this huge affordability crisis. And you know, people say, oh, the economy is good, right? And they look at things like employment or inflation. Um, and then they wonder, well, why aren't people happier, right? And the reason is, well, okay, inflation is just one metric that says something about affordability. Affordability is out of control. I mean, those stats show you just how high the minimum wage would have to be to cover housing. But my, uh, what I was including included things like healthcare and um, uh, utilities and things like that, because these are things that you, again, you need to truly have a chance of making it. Um, and so, you know, a living wage, I'm surprised that this doesn't have more momentum, um, you know, outside of my campaign, because I'm really tired of the minimum wage being this political football where it's just every few years, we have to go gather signatures and do these ballot initiative campaigns to raise it a few dollars. Um, you know, there have been some people who did great work in like Tukwila, Renton, Burien, smaller cities in Washington to raise their minimum wage. But it's like, um, the basic idea here is like, hey, if I work here, I should be able to live here. And that shouldn't be this constant financial anxiety. Uh Our governor of Washington State, Andre, so good to have you on the channel. Thanks, it's great to be here. Yes, yes, yes. And so um, there's a, quite a few questions as to why, because uh, a lot of us have seen you in independent media in the past, especially advocating for things like Medicare for all. We know you as the Medicare for all guy and which, you know, people like myself, I, I definitely agree with a single payer healthcare system. I am now more in favor of a nationalized system, which is even further than a single payer. I think you and I are pretty much both on the same side on that for the most part. But as far as giving everybody health care free at the point of service, we definitely agree on that. One of my biggest questions at first is why decide to run for governor of this state? Yeah, there's a number of reasons, you know, and I think the first observation is um, some folks might remember our governor, Jay Inslee, who ran for president in 2020. Uh, he's actually currently the longest serving governor in the United States. Um, he had kind of surprised a lot of Washington's kind of political class by running for a third term. There's a sort of informal two term limit on governors. There's not an official one in Washington, but many governors observe that. But, uh, you know, after 12 years of, of Jay Inslee, um, uh, you know, you just start to recognize that an open seat in a statewide position like governor is a rare thing. And there's a much wider spectrum of open mindedness and discourse um, discussion when there is that open competitive seat. So, um, you know, if uh, I were to say run in four years against an incumbent governor, uh, I don't think anyone would, you know, pay half as much attention as they do when there's this open seat. Um, so the the first is just that there's this huge opportunity. And as a political organizer, we need to see opportunity and, and uh, build off of these opportunities. Um, the second is when you work on an issue like universal health care for, say, six years, like I have, uh, you start to recognize that... Um, you know, you might, for instance, say, well, it's not the governor's job to make universal health care. It's the legislature's job to pass a law. Right. But, um, you know, again, I recall that when Jay Inslee ran in 2020, uh, there was a, a so-called public option, uh, not a very good one, but a public option introduced in Washington state sort of at the pleasure of the governor or whatever. Um, and uh, it, it flew right through the legislature. 
So when policy has the strong backing of a governor, uh, it suddenly becomes way easier to make happen. So I spend all day hearing, oh, talk to this commission, this needs additional study, this, that, and the other. But if I was governor, um, a lot of that would change. It would be able to go through those hoops a lot easier, a lot faster. So everything that I've been working on becomes much easier with the backing of a, of a governor. Um, and uh, the last is, the opportunity to engage with the public and engage on these issues, to insert electoral issues that otherwise wouldn't be there. Um, there are about 30 candidates in this race, but I'm the only one running on most of what you'll see on my platform. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so, um, you know, I'm a big believer in uh, you don't get what you don't ask for and you can't ask for what's not on your ballot. So I'm putting uh, I'm putting this on the ballot, a real alternative. OK. So we're going to get into in, into that. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, Washington's concern, from what I know, Washington seems kind of like a, a, a liberal bastion. Uh, you know, a lot of times people will liken it to states like California um, and Massachusetts and New York. But then we'll see a lot of undercurrent of more right wing, more pro corporate sentiment. Is that the same type of of reflection that you have of Washington, or is it more of just this, you know, more liberal bastion where it, things liberal policies just come a little bit more easier? What what is your personal view of that? Well, I think that. Um... I think that many people are tempted to make those comparisons to coastal uh, blue states, like you mentioned. I will mm -hmm. say one of the major differences is that Washington has one of the most regressive tax codes in the country. Um, and so that that becomes a pretty big limitation. It's one of the major things that I'm hoping to change. Um, some of these difficulties with our tax code are in the Constitution, which means that you need more than a simple majority to change it. Um, but I think the battle lines are just uh, there. There's high stakes out here for whatever reason. Um, you know, Seattle is a it's almost more culturally relevant than politically relevant, at least when you're thinking about national politics. Um, mm. And uh, so there's a strong socialist core, labor core in Washington. There have been many, many uh, important moments in the history of organized labor that happened in Seattle. Uh, and mm -hmm. then at the same time, the, the response to that from the sort of, um, you know, the forces of neoliberalism uh, are there as well. So when you compare to, say, Oregon, I think that we have a very similar sort of progressive mindset, right? But the, the industry is so much stronger here, right? And so it's in this constant battle between that more progressive socialist mindset and then a more neoliberal market-based capital mindset do you think that it's uh because it, it from what you're describing to me it sounds as if washington is is kind of almost like the americanized version not as progressive but americanized version of the european um the Euro more european social democratic type of mindset where it's like we want to keep capitalism in place. We just want things to be a little bit better for workers. Is that kind of more in line? Am I in the right direction or am I just way off? No, I think that that is a good comparison. The um, So I forgot to mention uh, there, there's that sort of very business minded side of things. And then, of course, in eastern Washington, when you get to the east of the of the Cascades, uh, you get into more rural kind of Trumpy. Um, Trumpy kind of uh, right of center politics. But when you're talking about this sort of so social democratic um, uh, mindset, I think that uh, yes, in some sense, that's the attitude of a lot of people. I would say we, we really have a long way to go before we would be able to claim to be delivering, you know, anywhere near the amount of uh, public services that these um, social democracies are able to do. And that's actually a, a core part of my pitch is, you know, Washington state has about 8 million people. 
it actually has one of the highest GDPs per capita in the world, even when you compare to other nations, right? Like Norway, Sweden. Um, and so for me, there's sort of this, uh, this mindset of being a US state where you're like, well, we're just a state, we can't do X, Y, and Z, right? And I'm trying to say, there really is no reason we can't have sort of nation scale infrastructure here in Washington that might make it feel almost like a different country, you know, a, a fundamentally different safety net, a fundamentally different social contract, where when you, you know, are born and raised in Washington, you know, I always have health care, I always, you know, I can go to school. Um, and it's not the same if I were to just go, you know, to a different state where that's, uh, that's not the case. And, you know, you, you've already seen some of that, right? So with Roe versus Wade, um, we've always had strong reproductive rights here in, in Washington. So when Roe versus Wade left, we still maintain them. And you see uh, actually um, a lot of people who come to Washington to access those services. Sure, sure. Well, now we're getting into the portion where we talk about policy. Uh, it's just like, a uh, friend to the channel, uh, Afini, has always said, policy is my love language. Well, same here. I would like to get into that because you actually have, uh, you know, quite a few policies in here that were impressive to me that I would like to get into. Um, let me see. Ah, here we go. Okay. So let me share my screen really quick so that we can start going line by line according to these policies. Now, of course, one of your your biggest crown jewel, as it were, for your policies is universal public health care. Um, the full policy here, um, you talk about the you know the examples of why it is important for us to have universal health care, uh, and pretty much uh, my audience can pretty much quote all the necessities. But I want to go down here to the bullet points. It says universal eligibility. All Washington residents must be eligible for public health care coverage, regardless of age, income or employment status. My question is, does this also cover immigration status or yes or no? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, that's actually one of the better things about Washington's health care system. Um, so our Medicaid program was able to receive a federal waiver that allowed it to um, incorporate um, undocumented immigrants. They're able to enroll in our Medicaid program or in any of the plans available on, on our exchanges. And since this is primarily an expansion of existing healthcare programs, those uh, eligibility uh, improvements would also apply to a universal system. Okay, great. Now, next bullet point is comprehensive coverage. Says public health care coverage must be comprehensive across all medically necessary care, eliminating the need for supplemental coverage. Some people, especially who are more corporate minded or more right wing, will say, well, does that eliminate or outlaw private insurance? What do you say to that? So in the context of a state single payer system, it's actually not legal in the current framework to uh, eliminate all private insurance legally. Um, so there's a federal regulation called ERISA and effectively plans that have been negotiated by unions and are self-funded, uh, you can't touch those. You can't say that you aren't allowed to uh, provide that health care to your workforce. That's something that through um, actually collaboration with the federal government, we might be able to integrate, um, you know, fully integrate into a public system. But uh, but fundamentally, um, the idea here is that you, we would have universal eligibility and comprehensive coverage if private, you know, if employers are able to offer something that makes people prefer that, you know, they want to enroll in that instead, that would certainly be uh, something they're willing to do. Um, and employers would be able to still uh, provide um, employer-sponsored plans if they wanted to. Uh, but the, I think the important thing is that as an individual, right, regardless of what your employer offers you, you are always able to enroll uh, into the public program. So would this be uh, essentially a, uh, dare I say, a Medicaid for all because it's statewide, because a Medicare for all would be a federal. So. Um, I mean, I think 
you could say it's an expansion of Washington's Medicaid program, right? It's it's an expansion of many programs. There. It doesn't eliminate Medicare, for instance, right? Medicare would continue mm -hmm. to exist. In fact, Medicare would also be expanded. Um, oh. And uh, and so we can't provide you know coverage to people in Missouri. Um, mm -hmm. But for instance, even people who may uh, live in, say, Oregon, but they work in Washington, they could be covered. Um, and so in that sense, it is a, I think of it as a statewide version of Medicare for all. Um, but when you really get into the details, you know, there are multiple streams of income, there's multiple programs, you know, mm -hmm. it's complicated. And so what we try to do is make it really simple. I don't necessarily care that this, is this a Medicare dollar or a Medicaid dollar? All I know mm -hmm. is I enrolled and I'm covered. Of course. You know, and one of the reasons why I ask this is because I, I and to, to, to add to your point a little bit, um, this can also, you know how, for instance, uh, so goes New York, you know, policies, then, you know, other countries, you know, it, it domino effects into those. Uh, same thing with California. I'm thinking of so goes Washington then, or, you know, people who are from Oregon, uh, once they start to see that, oh, well, I'm working in Washington and I have this coverage whenever I'm there, maybe we can bring that over into Oregon and this can bleed into other states in order to for them to start also having a more comprehensive healthcare, universal healthcare system. So is that the same frame of mind that you're coming from is to influence other states to go to also do what Oregon I'm sorry, what Washington would be doing if you were governor. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's so, sort of what I was implying earlier when I said Seattle is more culturally relevant than politically relevant or Washington yeah. state. You know, I think of us as we don't have like a the most electoral votes because we are not a swing state. You know, we very rarely get uh, visited um, by presidential candidates and that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And yet, you know, in my lifetime, there have been two sort of politically impossible things that happened in Washington and then uh, saw major proliferation beyond that. So cannabis, we were the first state to legalize that on the ballot. Um, and that has been legalized in a lot of states. Uh, there's still, unfortunately, a federal prohibition. But then um, uh, same with marriage equality passed in Washington and, you know, became federal policy really not that much later. And so for me, you know, there's all sorts of things that are considered politically impossible. But when I look at Washington state, I say, I think we can do that here. And I think this is actually the most effective way that we can export this to the rest of the country, maybe through a few states at first. And usually uh, pretty much everything that I'm saying in my platform, I want to be federal policy it would be better as federal policy. It'd help more people. Um, but uh, but, you know, I believe very much in. Uh, organizing my own community and, and having the greatest impact I can here in Washington as my means of expressing what I want to see federally. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, the next bullet points are pretty much, uh, you know, it speaks for itself. Free at the point of service. All services must be free at the point of use to ensure every individual may seek care regardless of financial situation. This is a beautiful point, especially I think that the person who is of very little means should have the exact same high level of care as somebody who is a Jeff Bezos or a Jay-Z or Beyonce. There should not be any type of lapse in coverage due to your financial standing. Nobody should have a lapse of coverage at all. So I completely love this point. The next bullet point is publicly financed. All public coverage must be financed through progressive taxation. And so, of course, I do agree with this. Ta progressive taxation would also make sure it is covered. Just a quick question so that, you know, people, for the people who may be watching, who may not agree with this type of policy, what do you say to those who say, well, how are we going to pay for it? Like, they, they would say progressive taxation, but uh how is that going to help the quote unquote job creators essentially what would you say to that yeah well i mean i think the easiest way to understand these two bullet points is uh really through analogy so people think free uh, how does free work people need money right and so 
um, I usually liken it to something like, say, the fire department, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we're all covered by the fire department. We don't think about it that much of the time. But if your house burns down and the fire department comes and puts it out, they don't hand you a bill afterwards. They don't send you one in the mail. And it's not because firefighters work for free and fire trucks don't cost money, right? Mm -hmm. It's just that it's already paid for. So uh, I think that's a really key thing for people to understand. And we just think that healthcare should be one of those things that's just already paid for. Um, and uh, when it comes to the cost, um, I think one thing people need to understand is that um, they pay an incredible amount for their health care coverage uh, if they're lucky enough to have it. And if you're not lucky enough to have it, this isn't going to cost you a thing. But um, but if you have insurance through your employer, uh, mm -hmm. you have your wages every month going towards premiums. You have some of it going to Medicare. Right. So. Uh, I, I was at Microsoft before I was a political organizer, right? And every pay stub had this chunk going to Medicare, which is a program that I support, but I'm not going to be covered for that for 30 years, right? Um, so yeah. we're just saying we're paying for it already. In fact, we're paying twice as much as other countries. We just want the health care, right? And so, um, you know, what we're proposing has some shifts from private spending to public spending. But overall, mm -hmm. it's a huge reduction. It's about five to thirteen billion less every year in terms of total healthcare spending. So this is a huge savings, really, for everyone. I mean, almost everybody. And if you uh, there's a there's some studies beneath that. Dr. Friedman uh, has run two for us, uh, but he actually has a breakdown for how this impacts different income groups. And it truly is only the top uh, one to five percentile who's paying more, even a little tiny bit. And it's really only the top 1% that's paying like a significant amount more. Uh, and, and frankly, they have absolutely the means to do so. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you so very much. Now we're going to be moving on to housing. This is your housing guarantee. As you know, housing is very close to my heart. Uh, I just recently endured a housing situation myself, which is why I'm in a different location now. Uh, so I'll just read the blurb here just to get into it. it says housing and healthcare addresses to deepest and the most basic needs for survival. It is nearly impossible for an individual to thrive if they don't have a roof over their head and the ability to have healthcare, their healthcare needs addressed. Uh, it says currently we live in a state which it is illegal to be homeless, a policy which fails to recognize its own role in making homelessness a permanent feature of society. Moving on to the bullet points, it says increase housing supply through new construction, increasing supply to meet a demand to help address rising housing prices. So do you see a, 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 a major need? Um, because one of my things that, and I typically have a gripe about this, is that a lot of times people say, well, we just need to build more housing. When we have a housing stock of over, what, 16 million housing, houses, and units already. Uh, it's like, why not just make those more available to people who are unhoused instead of having to just build more housing? What do you say to that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's not like a silver bullet with housing. And um, I think that, you know, there are maybe some areas where increasing supply is useful. I mean, I think that we need to increase uh, market rate housing um, you know, there's a lot of people out here and why, so housing, uh, Seattle is maybe one of the worst housing markets. <laughs> um, and mm. there are a lot of people who would love to buy market rate housing and they're just, uh, you know, they get scooped up really, really fast. They get offers over, uh, listing price, right. And people just, e even though they want to buy a house, they just can't. Right. And they have they have a significant amount of capital to do so, just not a lot for Seattle. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we don't just want to say, well, we're going to solve this with public housing, right? Or we're going to just solve this with, uh, you know, uh, rent control. I think that it's something where for some people, they don't want to live in public housing, right? They don't want to live in certain kinds of housing. So there are many different housing needs. Some people don't want to own a house at all, right? They just want to rent. Right. Um, so I think we need to address the needs of many different types of people, um, all of whom are feeling very failed by the housing market right now. OK. All right. Thank you very much for that. 
Let's go into the next bullet point. The next bullet point says eliminate exclusive single family zoning. While this has already been done, we need to ensure that it's not undone by a new administration. What does this exclusive family zoning mean? Yeah, so a lot of uh, neighborhoods in Washington state are zoned to be exclusively single family housing. And this causes a lot of issues. One, single family housing, not very dense, right? So for the amount of space that you're using, you're not actually housing very many people. Um, two, when you have exclusive single family zoning, you don't create very walkable communities, right? And so you create these large suburbs or urban suburbs where even just to get to the grocery store or something like that, you're hopping on a bus or getting in a car. Um, and so then this, again, bad use of space, right? Because the more we need cars, the more you need parking. Um, and so we need to build, um, we need to build better uh, living communities, denser, with more amenities uh, that better meet the needs of the people who live there. Um, and uh, yeah, um, you know, I guess I'll just add, you know, Washington State did eliminate exclusive single family zoning in large part, but actually many of the wealthiest neighborhoods were exempted from this. And so you mm -hmm. actually, with through our zoning policies, you can see a sort of continue, continuation of the legacy of redlining, you know, and um, I can't, you know, bust out a map and draw, drop, you know, get a pen out and show you exactly where all of that is. But this is expected, you know, um, okay. it's uh, it, it is the, um, you know, it's often called nimbyism, right? Well, I support housing, just not like close to me, right? Um, and uh, I think we need to push back against that and say, you know, this land is for everyone. It doesn't belong to you. You can't just hoard it here. Uh, you can't just leave it undeveloped. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that zoning is a very powerful tool. We need to change that. Um, so I think we can do better. We're doing better, but we can do better as well. Gotcha. Understood. Understood. The next bullet point actually is close to my heart, which, uh, it, you know, of course, policy is my love language. This is uh, tickling my chin a little bit. So this one is invest in alternative housing models, including social housing, cooperative housing and public housing. You want to just touch on that just for a quick second. Yes. So um, Seattle uh, has passed um, a social housing ballot initiative, and then they just actually passed another one mm -hmm. to provide it the funding it needs. Um, and I think this is going to provide a really good model looking forward. Um, so social housing is not quite the same as public housing. Um, it would be done, I think, more through sort of public private partnership. And you can have sort of sliding scales on the uh, rent. So people with more income, you know, tend to pay a little bit more. Uh, but they're tenant governed and i think that's really important you know so your house your, your living space is not just something that uh you live in at the leisure of a landlord it's something that you're an active participant in you're part of a community um and i think that's really important so a lot of what we're trying to do is ensure that there is a healthy relationship between sort of landowners and, and renters um and uh social housing i think provides a better model for that um, cooperative housing takes it a, a step further, right? That's tenant owned. Um, and that's something I was really interested in. I really wanted to start a housing cooperative, something I didn't quite manage to achieve. But, um, you know, uh, I think it's it's really promising because then, um, you know, you can be building equity, right? As, a, as somebody who's part of a living community, instead of just that rent going to somebody else, you know, we're all building our own equity in this land and this property. Um, yeah. And uh, one thing I learned in this time when I was looking into this is there is only one lender in Washington state who will actually provide a loan for a cooperative housing, right? So that's something that we can provide the sort of incentives and financial services to make this more practical. Uh, public housing is, um, you know, there's a, a legacy of public housing, right? And people often think of sort of housing projects that get very neglected and underfunded. Uh, but I think that public housing, like many public services, is really important. You know, we need to ensure that when the market fails, when it does not provide what people need, that it really is the state that comes in and says, you still deserve a place to live and we're going to provide you one. But these need to be um, mixed income. They need to be high quality. They need to not be underfunded. Um, mm -hmm. 
and and that sort of mixed community right where it's not just oh this is where we dump all the poor people and then we neglect it right well when it's our house as well right when it's my house and my neighbor's house and my cousin's house mm -hmm. we're going to take better care of it yeah well uh, and just a point uh to what you said uh, regarding public housing uh, a lot of people may not remember this uh this history but one of the things uh public housing has been around for decades within the united states and public housing was largely made up of white people back in the past until what happened was the great migration to the suburbs and then a lot of white people end up leaving public housing and going into homes in the suburbs but a lot of these housing projects actually were housed by a lot of people who were predominantly white or exclusively white and so once they started to leave for the suburbs then the public housing was no longer upkept as well as it should have because now more black and brown people started to take up that housing so really there's a white supremacy angle to it so if you were to continuously keep these housing projects well funded right then of course then the they won't be as run down they will be kept up well and then on top of it if you have people that if people see that is cared for then they also tend to care a little bit better about their surroundings as well which also goes into you know financially how they're doing and, and whatnot so when people talk about oh my god public housing is so horrible and it's like no it could be better if we just start paying for it you know it's, it's like a death by a thousand cuts this is what they like what, what they're doing with the na the nih i'm sorry the nhs and in, in in uh britain they're so slowly you know choking it out because they don't want it anymore but the thing is is like if you well fund it it works really well the, the cuts are often more expensive than the costs because um you know the this is a well-known statistic uh, that homelessness costs more than the cost of just housing them, right? And you really see this. A, a big part of what I'm trying to do with this platform is to to educate people on how these issues are related, right? So medical bills and medical debt and bankruptcy is the number one cause of homelessness, right? But homelessness yeah. is incredibly bad for your health. And so then your medical bills go up, right? And then this costs... Uh, so you're getting defibrillated in the emergency room and you can't pay. Well, that costs the hospital, right? And then um, because we have vagrancy laws, which, by the way, you know, we probably shouldn't. But uh, but that costs the law enforcement system to deal with that. It wastes their time, by the way. Um, and so all of these things just actually have higher costs than, than actually addressing the problem. The same way that, uh, you know maintenance on on your home right I, you can put it off but you know your monthly bills and the cost of the repairs are just going to keep going up of course of course now here's the next one i've seen this proposal uh, many times but you want to do it on a state level is uh enact a long-term vacancy tax to incentivize landlords to keep their properties competitively priced and occupied uh, so this really is just uh, a, a means to, you know, if, for instance, uh, I saw this happen in New York where uh, they were pushing towards a, a rent control. And so instead of actually renting to people, landlords would purposefully keep their apartments vacant and wait for the law to be repealed so that they can start renting and charging hires because they rather eat that price of not having it of not having it occupied than to uh than to have it occupied and have rent being controlled so it looks like what you want to do is if they have their uh if they have their apartments vacant for you know for so long then they will be taxed instead of keeping it vacant my question is, what frame of time do you think would be sufficient to start taxing them for having a vacant apartment? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that's one where I might, you know, need to dive a little deeper into the research and consult some policy experts and stuff. But, um, you know, I think that uh, 
I'm not sure if I've actually heard long-term vacancy tax used quite as much as vacancy tax. And I wanted to make sure I said long-term vacancy tax because I know that it it's not trivial to buy property, to develop it, to keep it rented out. People's lives are chaotic. Um, so, you know, people rent for a while. They intend to be there for a couple of years, but then they move out. Um, so yeah. I, I just, I want to make sure that we don't make um, developing housing to be something that's just too much of a hassle that people don't do it, right? Um, but we want to make sure that it's always better business to use your land than to just sit on it, right? And the problem with those vacant lots is that they're treating them as investments. It's actually, um, you know, more, uh, more profitable to just sit on it than it is to use it. And that's not a good use of, uh, it's not a good use of land when people need places to live. Of course, yes. And then the last one is make home ownership practical for the working class. While home ownership is not for everybody, nobody should feel forced into renting from a landlord due to financial barriers. Home ownership fosters stewardship of land, participation in the community, and starting of families. By ensuring that working folks have the ability to enter home ownership, we can raise the standards for all renters who will no longer be stuck in their situation. Landlords may still operate rental properties, but we still but we, but we'll have to offer real value over ownership to maintain tenants. So yes. So I uh, would like to move on to the next one. Um. So now, outside of public health care and guaranteed housing, then you talk about tuition free education. This one's pretty easy. Uh, so you want to expand public education to go beyond K through 12. How far do you think public education should go to, to be tuition free? Yeah, that's another, you know, great question because I, you know, I included public universities, community colleges and trade school. Now, when you think of a public university, you could spend the rest of your life there getting PhDs, you know, and I don't know if that's like a real problem, uh, you know, but um, I think of it more as the institutions, right? We need to make the university a free institution um, and then sort of the individual pathways that people take through that, you know, it's more to the individual and the university. Um, but I, I definitely think that, um, you know, we need, we need educated people um, across a, a huge number of disciplines. I, mm -hmm. And so, in my opinion, it's not exactly how far should it go. It's I'm trying to fulfill a certain role in society. I want a certain kind of job, right? A certain kind of position. Well, I should be able to go get the education I need to do that, whether it's an electrician or uh, to start a business or run for office or whatever, right? I should be able to get the education I need to do that job well without that being something that sets me back financially. It should be something where I'm trying to work here. I'm trying to give. Uh, so, you know, please just enable me to do that. Yeah, this reminds me of what happens uh, a lot of times in public libraries across the country where they will hold classes for different things in the public libraries. My question is, why are we able to do this through a public library without uh, without having to pay for it directly when we can also do this in our public universities as well to give people the education they need? Public universities as well as public vocational schools. I'm actually a product of vocational training. I actually went to a magnet high school called Career Academy High School. I went there for my junior and senior year and my elective was commercial foods and culinary arts. And so I was trained in culinary arts in my last two years of high school so that I did not have to go to college. And then I went into the industry and worked for six years until I got sick. So I'm a product of that. I also have friends who are in programs like digital publishing, um, uh, EMT, paramedics. We also had people, I had a friend that was in plumbing, uh, also auto body, auto tech. I had a friend who took an auto technician class as well. So now he is a certified mechanic. So there's many different ways. You also have welding and, uh, you know, uh, welding. And then you also have masonry classes and many different others. But, you know, I think that, you know, um, we have a, an oversaturation of college degrees in our country. And we have an undersaturation of vocational 
abilities in this country. And I think that we need to balance ourselves back out. And, you know, I think especially pushing for more public vocational school that is tuition free, I think would be a huge boom, not just to the local economy in places like Washington, but it also can influence a lot of other states to to push for more vocational uh, education in order to help build the country once again. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I just I think that the the money calculus and education has been a huge part of what's ruined it right so it's it's in order to keep up in society right it, it just life gets more expensive so then that university degree was something you needed right but then because everyone felt that they needed that university degree it became this huge honey pot for well let's jack up the prices of a university degree and get everyone uh buried in debt right and so i think it's like we need to remove the um the costs so that it's not this, uh, you know, just this means of extracting money. And then we also need it. We need to take care of people's basic needs so that they can, instead of just being like, oh God, you know, I need to just keep getting educated so that I keep up and keep taking on debt so that I don't get farther behind and instead be able to, to breathe and just say, what do I want to do? You know, what are the jobs out there that people need people to do? And have it be less of this like money status based rat race. Yeah, definitely. The next one is a living wage. This is pretty much self explanatory. Uh, it says here a cost of living based minimum wage would automatically adjust it annually, uh, incorporates cost of healthcare, housing, food, utilities, and gasoline, adjusted based on hiring location to encourage local hiring, and minimums set based on averages at state, county, and municipal level. So this is pretty much, uh, you know, just pretty much self-explanatory, a living wage. Um, I'm not sure if, have you ever heard, ever heard of the low income housing coalition? I haven't heard of that. Okay. So the low income housing coalition actually has a, a chart that's called at a glance and they put it out every year. In fact, in two days from now, their new 2024 at a glance will be out. Uh, I'll be referencing to 2023 because, unfortunately, uh, we're not there yet because it's the 25th. It comes out on the 27th. But just to share the at a glance with you, uh, this, and I can always uh, send you the link to this, but it shows uh, how much do you need to earn to afford the modest apartment in your state? It says hourly wage required to afford a two-bedroom rental home by state. If you go to Washington, it shows Washington state, your state is actually number five. It's the fifth most expensive state to live in with the average wage of $36.33 per hour required to afford a two bedroom rental, which means you would need to work 92 week, no, 92 hours a week in order to, uh, in, or needed to at the minimum wage to afford a two bedroom rental home. So you need to work 92 hours a week at Washington's minimum wage. Um, let me share this. Uh, your current working minimum wage is 1574 an hour. So you would have to work 77 hours to afford a modest one bedroom at fair market rent. So it just shows how a true living wage would be at the rate of what you could afford for to, to afford a two bedroom a two bedroom apartment, which would be yeah, yeah, well that's housing of set thirty seven dollars an hour. Yeah, Washington's expensive, you know, and uh, you know when I first put my platform out, it was just like this big list of like seventeen things and. Uh, I had to narrow it down to, I didn't narrow it down, but I chose a few to emphasize and I chose the four that we've gone over so far. So healthcare, housing, education, and wages, uh, and put them under the banner of make Washington affordable. Because the thing that people are really feeling is just that there's this huge affordability crisis. And, you know, people say, oh, the economy is good, right? And they look at things like employment or inflation. Um, and then they wonder, well, why aren't people happier, right? And the reason is, well, okay, inflation is just one metric that says something about affordability. Affordability is out of control. I mean, those stats show you just how high the minimum wage would have to be to cover housing, 
But my uh, what I was including included things like healthcare and um, uh, utilities and things like that, because these are things that you again, you need to truly have a chance of making it. Um, and so, you know, a living wage, I'm surprised that this doesn't have more momentum, um, you know, outside of my campaign, because I'm really tired of the minimum wage being this political football where it's just every few years we have to go gather signatures and do these ballot initiative campaigns to raise it a few dollars. Um, you know, there have been some people who did great work in like Tukwila, Renton, Burien, smaller cities in Washington to raise their minimum wage. But it's like um, the basic idea here is like, hey, if I work here, I should be able to live here. And that shouldn't be this constant financial anxiety. Um, and so I think by incorporating a lot of these things in, into wages, you, you sort of force the business class, you know, people who are the job creators, the employers to say, hey, if, if I'm on the hook, say, for, uh, for housing, because if the cost of housing goes up, then the living wage that I have to pay goes up, well, then they become incentivized to say, hey, maybe I have an opinion about housing. Maybe I want more housing to be built so that as as an employer, I don't have to, um, you know, deal with the inflated housing prices in my wages. True. Yes, yes. Um, moving on to these. Uh, this one uh, actually piqued my interest. I uh, This one, uh, a lot of people don't talk about. Universal basic dividend. Uh, it says here, it says universal basic income is a, is possible at the state level and could be structured in a very similar way to the famous Alaska Permanent Fund, which pays out cold, hard money to every Alaskan on a yearly basis based on Alaska's oil profits by enacting a windfall profits tax. The top businesses in Washington state and then distributing those funds evenly as a direct cash payment to all Washington residents. The prosperity of our business sector will become synonymous with the prosperous people. No longer will business interests be seen and treated as separate from people's interests. So this is really interesting to me. Um, you know, uh, and you're basically taking the idea from Alaska. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I uh, really enjoy working on state policy and, and um, I really enjoy learning from what other states have achieved. And they come from places that you wouldn't always expect. Right. So Alaska mm -hmm. is a rural state. It trends conservative. Um, and yet they have this wonderful uh, way of sharing their oil profits among everybody. You know, and I think mm -hmm. that it goes to show you that um, you know, these uh, sort of political battle lines, they get treated as gospel, right? This is the way the right thinks. This is the way the left thinks. But when you get some new ideas that just people aren't quite as familiar with, you see that their minds open up and they go, why wouldn't I want to get a small cut of Washington's business profits, right? And uh, fundamentally, the idea here is that businesses don't exist in a vacuum, right? Businesses are here in Washington and they're successful here in Washington because uh, the people of this state are all contributing by by being the economic activity. Um, and so we all, frankly, deserve a cut of that. Oh, and and by making it as a dividend, I'll, I'll just add, you know, when you say, well, you know, everyone gets this amount of money every month, right? Well, the economy changes, right? That theoretically could um, become unaffordable, right? But by making it a percentage of profits, it could never be insolvent. So there might be strong years where people get a higher payout and weaker years where you get a lower one. Um, the point is not to say that th this isn't actually supposed to be, oh, well, I need that in order to make rent. That's supposed to come from these other parts of the platform. This is supposed to be more like a bonus or a dividend that you know people are familiar with if they happen to own stocks or you know have a little more experience in the in the private sector well it's giving money to the stakeholders it's the cherry on top exactly right? okay gotcha uh so uh one of the things that i also wanted to before i get to fair free public transit which is something i also want to talk about you talk about universal basic dividend. One of my questions is, is that I did not see on here a reparations policy for American descendants of slaves. I know that the Green Party, which you are running with, also has a reparations policy. There is an extensive reparations policy under Dr. Jill Stein, who's running for president right now. 
what is your view of reparations and how would you implement it, especially towards uh, ADOS Washingtonians? Yeah, you know, I think that reparations is a really uh, important policy. Um, and I think that when you think about the legacy of slavery, um, it's a huge stain on American history. Um, and that's why I think it makes a lot of sense as a federal policy. Um, when it comes to states, I think the relationship between the sort of state's responsibility and the federal government's responsibility can be less clear. Uh, Washington state, for instance, you know, was founded after, um, you know, after the Civil War um, and emancipation. That does not mean, absolutely does not mean that we don't have some legacy here. Um, when I think about the, the real legacy of these things in Washington, I tend to think more of things like redlining, right? And so when mm -hmm. I look at for instance, the housing guarantee, and, and maybe this needs to be articulated more specifically, but, you know, we're talking about increasing home ownership. We're talking about, um, in, you know, ending homelessness. And I think a, a huge amount of priority has to go towards um, righting a lot of these disparities that happened in the sort of uh, development of the suburbs and stuff like that in Washington. Um, I also think our native communities probably deserve serious consideration on this, may have been more directly displaced and, and impacted by, uh, by the sort of settling of Washington. Um, but that said, uh, I'm not opposed to it. You know, I think I would need to maybe look into more details. I didn't consider it a part of this dividend. You know, I think of the dividend as sort of handling a different question. But um, I think that we have a lot of um, well, we have a lot of history that we are trying to, uh, we are trying to make just and, uh, reparations is certainly part of that conversation. Yeah. One of the reasons why I ask is because there is actually someone who is actually working on reparations policy within Washington state that I had on, uh, his name, uh, the two gentlemen at Jamin Mason and Khalif Mitchell who are working uh, who were in talks with uh, Jason Call, who is the who's also running for office in Washington, but also the campaign manager for Dr. Jill Stein. And they actually have this website called American Union Reparations, and it talks about reparations uh, at the state level in Washington State, and it talks about uh, you know the reparations policy. And there, in fact, there is actually, and I was trying to find it, there's actually a, um, an approval in the state of California uh, for, I think it's $12 million in possible reparations in California that they've been organizing for. Uh, and so, of course, you know, California also, like Washington, was made a state into the union post-Civil uh, War. However, they still had some uh, instances where, you know, slave masters would, uh, or enslavers, I should say, would bring their slaves there. And then the state would actually look the other way while these enslavers still had s uh, slaves working for them, especially in the gold uh, rush at the time. So this could be, you know, similar to Washington State. So, of course, reparations will still be due. Uh, and of course, uh, when it comes to mass incarceration, redlining, black coats, Jim Crow. So all these different things that are also indicative for reparations. So um, one of the things I recommend is to, you know, I can give you the contact information to reach out to people like Jamie Mason and Khalif Mitchell for reparations policy so that you can also have that because there's a lot of people who are American descendants of slaves or if they do not see a reparations policy on your platform, they will go somewhere else. And so, you know, for people who like yourself who are running an independent or third party candidacy for a state like Washington, I think it's deeply important as well, because a lot of times we tend to feel left out and forgotten as well. And so I just wanted to bring that to your attention too. I appreciate that a lot. And uh, I guess um, one thing I'm curious about you know, is when it comes to 
state level reparations like my opinion is that uh states absolutely should deliver where the federal government has failed right and so if we can uh pick up this slack where we don't see this movement happening on the federal level we absolutely should in washington and i just want to make sure that you know whatever action we took wasn't seen as somehow um relieving the federal government of its responsibility to um to also um address this issue of course uh yeah but you know i think i think it's a responsibility of both federal and state um it's just like for instance what happened in tulsa uh the the uh, the survivors of the tulsa race massacre there's three of them that were over 100 years old were denied uh and so it's you know they also the oklahoma also has a responsibility for the reparations for that as well in fact while i have it up here um one of the people who is viewing watching right now katie lewis actually wrote an article about this very topic talking about justice denied ongoing fight for reparations in oklahoma so of course there are people who would be in washington state that would be old reparations based on uh, the inconsistencies and uh, the looking away by Washington State. So I think that it would be a, you know, a multi-pronged approach for states, not only to give reparations, but also through the federal government as well. So, yeah. Um, and also just a question about, uh, you know, reparations, would it also be, uh, would you also, if in case you were to put that on your platform, would also cash reparations be included in that as well? Well, that's kind of what I was getting at, I guess, when I was saying that, um, that the way that we do reparations, I think is really important. And, and again, cash reparations, not something I'm opposed to, but I really, really wouldn't want to ever create a situation where, you know, we wrote a check and we're like, it's done. There's nothing else to talk about here. Right. And to me, the, the legacy of slavery and segregation is it's so much deeper than just cash. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, in a lot of ways, you know, I want to see the injustices and the disparities in our education system and our healthcare system. These are the ones where I really want to see uh, the ongoing um unfairness uh, addressed so one second I, my vacuum is mm -hmm. apologies i have a robot vacuum um no uh I, I think it's really important to address the the really deep causes of of um inequality especially racial inequality uh, and then um, I think cash reparations in addition to that is is uh, really, really essential. So, um, you know, I tend to be focused on uh, the sort of structural issues that we still see. Um, and then uh, I think that the cash reparations make sense. But it's kind of similar to like um, we could relieve a lot of college debt, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then in a few years, we'd see a, another college debt crisis. So it's sort of like if we do free college and then relieve the debt, we can actually end the, you know, the debt crises and prevent future debt crises. So that's sort mm -hmm. of the structure that I'd like to see is the, the structural issues deeply addressed uh, so that we could make the case that the cash reparations, you know, were actually more complete, I guess. Okay, so you want to take a multi-pronged approach, I, I see. Um, and so, yeah, this is from Camille Moore. I uh, said, historic moment, California commits $12 million for 2024-2025 to begin implementing reparations for descendants of slaves, making a significant step towards justice. This is the first commitment since Florida's Rosewood massacre reparations and before that during Reconstruction. Note this funding support bills that may be enacted into law. So continued advocacy is crucial. So she actually shows this uh, reparations implementation funding. So just to share that that was actually from California as well. Um, and so I want to move on to 
uh, the free fare public transit, which is also something that I really like. As somebody that takes public transportation, I would like to see this especially. Uh, it says fares as flat point of use fees are inefficient and regressive way to raise revenue to pay for public transit. Fare collection slows down transit service, requires expensive additional infrastructure, and creates problems related to enforcement. Fair free public transit simply uses our perfectly good system of taxes and tax collection to raise all the money needed to fund public transit like roads, fire departments and libraries. Public transit ought to be a service that was made widely available for free use to as many Washingtonians as possible. If you'd like to expand a little bit on that as well, I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so public transit is uh, I think of it as a public good. And that is to say that uh, the more public transit that we have, uh, the more people are able to move about the state and do the things that they need to do, um, and the less they need to rely on cars. Um, so that's less pollution, but it's also less vehicle-related deaths and other things like that. Uh, we're at a, a huge um, national high on vehicle-related fatalities. That's something that um, I really would hope to see uh, if we could reverse. But um, there are lots of ways to encourage people to use public transit more. So better service hours, better, um, better range, better coverage. Uh, what I like about fare-free public transit is it's... So, so, you know, I could have just said expand public transit, right? And that means there's all sorts of expansions that I get into. But fare-free public transit has this quality where it changes the way people think about it, right? And they start to say, oh, I get it. I could just hop on the bus, right? Um, and they, they can really imagine how much that would really make their life more convenient. So I think that, um, you know, fare-free public transit is something that has the ability to actually change our mindset around these things, make people see the advantages over car-based travel more. Um, and it's really nice that it's already been enacted in our capital of Olympia. So it's easy for people, you know, when you just say something that just comes out of left field, they, I don't know about that, right? But when you're like, well, this is happening right now in this state. So we're just saying, you know, we should do that across the entire state. Um, it doesn't seem so scary. Well, and just to, you know, to include um, with what you just said, uh, fa uh, fare free public transportation is also uh, pretty easy to implement. I mean, there it, it exists here in Florida and it's not statewide, but I'll give you a perfect example. Here in Orlando, we actually have a fare free public transportation policy, which is called Limo, L Y M M O. Limo is an extension of the links public transit system that we have here in Orlando. And Limo is just limited to the downtown area of Orlando, which we, I think we have four lines. I think we have uh, the, the, the lemon line, the orange line, grapefruit line. And I think the, uh, I think it's the line, uh, lime line. Yeah, we have four different lines that run through downtown Orlando and they stop every uh i think it's every, during peak times i think it's every nine to ten minutes and then or no it's, i think it's every five minutes during peak times and then every 15 minutes during at night uh you know after office hours and so all it does is just pulls up you jump on and you ride and that's it and so you got to think about you know for instance how much time is it in collecting fares because that also increases the amount of time. And then on top of that, having to police people who don't pay their fare, that's money that also has to go through municipalities um, and you know things like that. So just a, one, a quick question also, um, is, there a, is there more of a, a statewide transit system that could go from city to city? Is that something that you can be thinking about trying to link, for instance, Olympia to to Tacoma to Seattle, you know, almost like a almost like a light rail or yeah, high I mean, we have rail. we have a light rail in development. I mean, it's been taking 
decades. Uh, we missed out actually really big time in the in the early 90s. We could have gotten a huge federal grant to build a whole transit system, and it ended up going to Atlanta because I guess we didn't want it. Um, but we are finally getting around to building it. Um, and the biggest complaint anyone has about it is just how long it's taking for the stations to become uh, usable. And also that, you know, we're still just talking about connecting Seattle to Bellevue on the east side, right? That's just crossing Lake Washington. I want to see high speed rail from Seattle all the way to eastern Washington and Spokane and the Tri-Cities down to Portland and up to, you know, Vancouver and Canada, right? And that that's what I would like to see. I mean, I spent about, a, um, I guess, about a month in Japan. I took uh, bullet trains all over the country. And it really just shows you, you know, um, everyone uses it. Everyone uses it. It's easy. It's nice. Um, it's not that expensive. So uh, I think that we maybe lack some of the statewide transit infrastructure because a lot of the times this is handled by either local or regional authorities. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, you know, that's maybe that's definitely something we need to develop is more of a statewide view on this because, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, people don't just commute within within a city, right? They do commute between between states yeah and like for instance like one of the places that i always wanted to visit was china and they have i think it's over twenty thousand miles of high speed rail track just in china alone and they're building even more and these high speed trains go well over 200 miles an hour you know to link between cities and I'm just thinking to myself, like in a perfect world, like let's say hypothetically, I was the governor of Florida. I would be trying to take, because we have what's called the bright line now, I would not have it uh, privately owned. I would have it publicly owned and I would have it crisscrossing the state to link different cities. And from what I observe, Washington is a pretty big state. And so to be able to traverse Washington with high speed rail, would also really link all those cities more. And let's say hypothetically you live in more like the rural areas of Washington state, but you want to work in the city. Well, there may be a station not too far from you so that you can work in the city, but live out in the rural areas. So I think that that would be a huge boom to just uh, bring Washington more together. And I think that'd be pretty cool. It, absolutely. You know, I think the connections between people is really important, but also, you know, we were talking about housing earlier and like, like you've pointed out, there's a lot of room here, you know, and that, that's kind of what I'm getting at. If we just use the space that we have, if we use the funds that we have, we really can um, address all of these issues. So I think mm -hmm. that, uh, I think that just, you know, connecting, connecting people and making better use of Washington state is, uh, is a really good path forward. Mm -hmm. I have one more policy. Is that okay? Absolutely. I don't want to go. Over. Okay. So this one I wanted to go over really quick uh, was public banking. Uh, as you know, uh, people who have watched this channel, I've actually talked about public banking many times before. Um, and I see it as a great way in order to implement infrastructure. Um, and so you actually talk about public banking here, uh, and public banking just for people is really just a bank that is, uh, the, the bank exclusively for the state. And it is not necessarily open to the public, but the use of the bank is for the public for especially infrastructure. So it, it, I can liken to it like this. Whereas if you are with a commercial bank and let's say you make a deposit of $100, that bank will take your money. They will store your $100, but they will also take your $100. They will put it into the market, grow that $100, let's say to $1,000, and then they'll keep that $900 and put that $100 back into your account that you've been storing. And so they basically made money off of your money. Well, what if we took our tax revenue that we had? and then put it into a public bank 
grew the tax revenue into the market. And then whatever that tax revenue that grown, that same revenue is put back into the public sector in order to do infrastructure projects, like for instance, a high speed rail within the state. So that's basically the gist, the simple gist of a public bank. So if you want to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I definitely got interested in public banking because I recognized that it was something that was going to make all the other things that I want more feasible. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so then I looked into, has anyone been working on this? And I found the Seattle City Council feasibility study. And it really illustrates why we need this because mm -hmm. Seattle City Council unanimously voted to divest from Wells Fargo, which is the Good. depositor for all city funds. <laughs> <laughs> they did. And the reason was because they were invested in the Dakota Access Pipeline. So right. they kicked off this huge study to figure out what they were going to do with the city's funds. And ultimately, they couldn't find any bank that could uh, basically handle their needs um, that wasn't also invested in the Dakota Access Pipeline. And so they ended up renewing their contract with Wells Fargo. Right. Oh. right. We really, yeah. So the best thing we got out of it was the feasibility study, which does help us kind of chart how we could do this. Um, but there's lots of, you know, little things. So like I mentioned, those housing cooperatives, right? Our public bank could say, we want more cooperative housing. So we're going to provide the loans for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, like you're mentioning, you can raise revenue through investment rather than through taxation. People don't like taxes, but investments to fund things is great. Um, and uh, so, and, and I, I'll just add, you know, it. there are legal challenges for why, uh, you know, the services provided to people might be different than a regular bank. There are actually ways around that, but, um, you know, we are one of those states that has legalized cannabis, uh, but it's still all cash because, you know, if you're working with banks that are part of like a federal network, right, and then there's federal prohibition, they don't want to deal with it. Uh, but a state bank could say, look, this is our money. This is our state. This is our industry. Um, and so, yeah, you know, we are going to provide the uh, credit services and stuff for people to pay with plastic. Yeah. So this bank, uh, a public bank of Washington would be very similar to the Bank of North Dakota, mm -hmm. uh, which is the pretty much I think is the only public bank in any state in the union. So. Uh, Bank of North Dakota actually was uh, integral in shielding a lot of people from in North Dakota from the from the financial crisis back in 2008. Uh, so, it, you know, they, you know, didn't feel as much of the sting of the financial crisis because, uh, you know, they had that public bank. Um, something I would like to share with you. Uh, I had a guest on here named Nelson Betancourt as well as Alpha and Maturity. They're from the National um, Public Banking Institution. Uh, they actually put out a chart that I would like to share. I shared it before on here, but I think it's uh, really great. It's called At a Glance. It's an infographic about how public banking actually works. And this is uh, very educational and it talks about the difference between public banking so it has different depositories and it has a public bank, benefit bank corp, credit unions, local community banks and big banks. And it shows all the advantages of what a public bank would entail. And it talks about like how it could be in, uh, implemented, it talks about full transparency by the public, uh, having public advisory boards. Uh, so this is uh, a great resource. Uh, I'll send this also to you. But this also talks about the capabilities, uh, how public banks are actually owned uh, and basically talks about how it's actually publicly owned and it's ran by people who are professionals in banking, but they do not uh, they do not get their, their incentive is to make sure that the bank runs as efficiently as possible for the public. So. Uh, yes. So I would just like to, you know, share that with you as well. I mean, yeah. because it's a public bank, it doesn't uh, it doesn't need profit to be its sole function. Right. I mean, a huge part of what happens with these, you have like the taxpayer money for the city. Right. But it's mm -hmm. in some out of state financial institution and then they're charging interest. So it's like 
a higher cost. And then that money is just being moved out of the state. Um, and the only reason that financial institution is going to provide that loan is because they're going to get a profit off of it, right? A public mm -hmm. bank could say, this isn't about the profit. This is about developing something in this community that we want. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the sort of citizen oversight, the democratic control of it is uh, intended to provide something that a commercial institution can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. So I would like to, you know, share that with you. I'll send you that link uh, that also would help uh, in educating people about public banks and how they how they uh, could really be a benefit to to people. And then just one more question about, um, you know, for instance, you know, public banks, many different uh, avenues for different policies. How, what is your view of uh, using the bully pulpit of the governor's seat of governor to push for different citizen ballot initiatives? If in case you can't do it through uh, an executive order via governor, uh, you be would you be game to try to go through the route of just having the people implemented through a citizen ballot initiative? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I have uh, run ballot initiatives before. I'm a big believer in them. And uh, I don't know if we'll get into it today, but there's actually a whole section on democracy reform, uh, basically because I'm really tired of um, how hard it is to get things done. Um, you know, things that have an incredible amount of popular support uh, struggle to get represented well in our government. Um, and I think ballot initiatives as a really, really important release valve for the citizens to say, okay, I'm not going to keep wasting my time asking for this. I'm just going to do the work, put it on the ballot myself. Um, and I think that one of the differences between kind of what I have to offer and what a lot of, um, a lot of the other candidates is just that, uh, direct democracy like ballot initiatives is usually treated as completely separate from the sort of traditional legislative process. And to me, um, I look at it as completely a uh, legitimate part of the game. And as a governor, you know, I'm more about getting these things done for the people. Um, mm -hmm. And if uh, my, you know, you know, when I've been out there running these initiative campaigns, I would have I can't tell you how much the support of a governor would have meant, right? So if I'm in that position, I'm 100% giving that support to all of the movement builders out there. And I think, I hope, uh, I don't know if I've kind of made this clear on this, but um, this run is for the movement builders out there. It's for the activists, for the political organizers. I'm trying to put your issues onto this platform. I'm trying to highlight these organizations. So I, I have those movement highlight sections. I'll definitely be throwing some of those links you shared with me on this website. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm trying to take political movements that already exist and say, we're getting these things over the finish line. Yeah, yeah. And just, sorry, one more thing I, I, I like. But there was a, a, a tweet by Jason Call that was uh, put out uh, a couple of days ago where he talked about uh, electronic uh electronic signatures for ballot initiatives as well as getting people on the ballot in the state are you for being able to have signatures collected electronically for for instance for getting people on the ballot in the state for ballot initiatives and things like that for petitions yeah so absolutely i mean one of the biggest challenges okay. we've had in the last couple of years when i've been doing this has just been like covid right mm -hmm. made it really hard to get anyone to want to go out and gather signatures or be approached by someone and touch a pen that kind of thing right so we really saw the need for this because um you know we had to collect wet signatures with a pen out in public right in some states it's even worse you have to get it notarized um but uh these are pretty obvious barriers to citizens um, getting things on the ballot. And I think that there's there's a slightly delicate balance because right now the unfortunate reality is if you are a billionaire, it's pretty easy to get something on the ballot. You can just pay signature gatherers, they'll get it done in a, you know, a month or whatever. Um, and then you're gonna get it on the ballot. And in fact, uh, we have a billionaire named Brian Haywood who's managed to get six, six initiatives uh, on the ballot and they're all um, they're all very um, uh, well. Um, 
anyway, uh, I, I won't get into them too much. I don't want to breathe life into them, but um, but the point is he was able to get that done really easily. So what I'd like to see is something where, you know, the first chunk of signatures, like maybe the first 50,000 or so, uh, have to be collected without paid signature gatherers. And then at that point, you can start to um, build a movement on top of that. So I, I think we want to make sure that our initiative process is something that is primarily for the citizens and is actually a reflection of real political movement and not just that one person had the money to pay to get it on the ballot. And uh, I think that sign digital signatures will make that way cheaper. So that's a good thing, but we want to make sure that we don't accidentally just completely overwhelm and spam the system. All right. Thank you so very much for all those nuanced answers in regards to the different policies and your platforms. And I'll make sure to send you those links into the, your DMs so that you can have those available. But yes, uh, look, uh, please let people know uh, where they can find you, also what resources that you have so that they can either volunteer or donate. Uh, and I'll also put the links in the chat as well for the people. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. And I think the, the first place you should stop is my website. That's publicstackhouse.org. Um, and uh, you'll find um, I'm on all of the socials pretty much. So publicstackhouse.org slash socials, TikTok, Discord, everything. Um, and uh, I would think that, um, you know, you can sign up to volunteer, but uh, if you're in Washington, I've got that banner pledge to vote. So that's the easiest action. You can just uh, pledge on your phone or computer, and then you can share that link for other people. So that's gonna help me uh, just get people to know about my campaign and know that they're out there ready to vote for me. But um, mostly this is about spreading the word. So if you can spread some word of mouth, uh, I think that's going to help more than anything else. All right. I make sure to put it inside the chat. All right. So everybody, thank you so very much to Andre Stackhouse for joining me. Uh, and I wish you all the best and success. And uh, this, uh, this is going to be uh, something to look forward to this November. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jvfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.